Whenever you're moving a piano, there's three types of people. There's the person that's going to get behind the piano and push. There's the person that's going to get in front of the piano and pull. And then there's the third person who's just going to go grab the stool. We like to do the least amount possible. We like to do the least amount possible. How many of you work with somebody who likes to do the least amount possible? How many of you have a family member that, that, that likes to do the least amount possible? If you're not raising your hand, just say it. <laughs> we tend to want to do the least amount possible at work, at home, even in sports. I mean, one of the biggest things that frustrates a lot of my kids is whenever they're on a sports team and somebody is doing the least amount possible. But the thing is, even when it comes to going to church, to following Jesus, to being a disciple, we like to do the least amount possible. A lot of people like to come in and sit down and they just want to be a pew sitter. Nothing else, nothing beyond. They want to put their quarter, their $20 bill in the offering place, sit down and do nothing else. They think that's enough. Even when it comes to telling other people about Jesus. How many believers who really believe in the gospel share the gospel. We have a problem. If we don't care if people are going to hell, we don't appreciate the heaven we might be going to. If we really don't care if people go to hell when they die, we really don't appreciate the heaven we might be going to. Now, what do I mean by that? The older I get, I have a rough time believing that if you don't care if people die and go to hell, I don't know if you really get it. I really don't know if you have embodied the gospel in your heart and in your life. We like to be, here, here, here's a good example. We like to be like spectators at a football game. You think of these big football stadiums. You've got 100,000 people watching what's going on while these 22 guys are on the field watching the game. Most people are the 100,000 watching. They're not the 22. But here's the thing. Jesus, if we're a follower of Jesus, he wants us to be part of the 22. Jesus wants us in the game. Jesus wants us in his game. Jesus wants us on his team. Jesus wants us playing very hard for him. He tells us that. Matthew 28, 19, he says, go Therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go. We call this the Great Commission. Some people might even call it the Great Command. Now, here's the issue with that. That very first word, go, we think of it as a command. It's actually a present active participle. A better translation is while you are going. While you are going, make disciples. It's more of an expectation then it is a command. Jesus expects you to tell other people about what he did on the cross, and that's the first step to making disciples. Um, but we have to have a burden for the lost. We have to care if people are going to hell. There's an evangelist named Bailey Smith. Now, Bailey Smith is kind of like a, a smaller version of Billy Graham. How many of you know Mark Stansberry? Mark Stansberry got saved while Bailey Smith was preaching. He responded to an altar call that Bailey Smith gave. And Mark walked the aisle and got saved that night. So he would go around and he wouldn't do these big crusades like Billy would do. He would do these small crusades. And he in the early 2000s came to my hometown. My job at his crusade was to be one of the ones where people kind of, he would give the altar call, the invitation, and people come down to this. My job was to go down and talk with people through what they were doing, pray with them, help lead them into whatever following Jesus looked like for them at that moment in time. Now, this was coming Georgia. Okay, a lot of times you hear people and they say, 
the, the belt buckle of the Bible belt is Texas. That is false. The belt buckle of the Bible belt is North Georgia and Southern Tennessee. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Cody will give it to me. That's, that's the way it works. That's real. Because you can go every mile. There is like a Baptist church every quarter mile. Every you go. They are all over the place. So the very first night of this crusade, Monday night, poor Bailey, he is, he's preached, he's talked. I would say 99%, if not 100%, of the people in attendance that night were regular churchgoers. But I don't think there were many unbelievers. I don't think there were many de-church people there. And he is there, and he gives the altar call. And you can feel his burden for the lost. Him pleading with people, coming forward. And as soon as he gives it, he's waiting, and nobody comes. And he has said, I cannot believe that there's no conviction in this place. That there's nobody who has never heard the gospel and never committed publicly that wants to come down. There's nobody in here that is struggling with something that just needs to be prayed for. There's nobody in here just needs to come down and give a hug. And I'm sitting in the back going, I think I need to go down. Like I am getting convicted as he goes because he had a burden for the lost. Now here's the thing. The key for sharing the gospel depends on your burden for the lost. The key for your effectiveness in sharing the gospel is your burden for the lost. Let me see what your burden for the lost makes the difference in how effective you will be in sharing the gospel. So, so if we know that, if we know that we have to have a heart for the lost, if we know that God expects us to go and share, what are some sharing gospel principles? Some sharing the gospel's principles. We're jumping back into Luke chapter 10. We finished six weeks on talking about marriage till death do us part. I had people tell me that was the best series I have ever done. I also had people say, Joel, I'm not coming back to church till you're done. Because the conviction was too high. So we're jumping back in. Luke chapter 10. Jesus has spent his time with his 12 disciples. He's went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He is coming down. He has set his face to Jerusalem. His face to the cross. Everything from chapter 10 verse 1 onward is looking forward to his death, burial, and resurrection. Luke chapter 10 verse 1 and 2 says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. 72 others. Jesus had the 12 for the first 10 chapters, the first 9 chapters, beginning all the way, I think, back in chapter 3, chapter 4. He has spent time with the 12. He has already sent them out to share the gospel. Now, we're over the mountain, we're down the mountain, we're going to Jerusalem, and he chooses 72 more. Kind of blows our mind when we think about it. Jesus had the 12, and he also had the 72. And he sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. That means there are many people out there who need to respond to the gospel. There's a lot of people out there who are dying and going to hell because they've never given their life over to Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's not enough people telling other people about Jesus. There's not enough people telling other people about Jesus. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We get two things from these two verses. Number one, Jesus had the 12 and 72 and you. Jesus had the 12 and the 72 and you. The 12 were supposed to go out and share the gospel. The 72 were supposed to go out and share the gospel. You are supposed to go out and share the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. But before you do, pray before you go. Pray before you go. Analyze your life. Look at your life. I challenge you just to pick one person. 
One person that you know that does not know Jesus. One person that you know that needs to follow Jesus and start praying for that person. Praying for their heart. Praying for their soul. Praying their, for, for their conviction. Praying that they would believe in Jesus. I've got a buddy that I've been praying for since Jace was five years old. For him to come to know Jesus as his Savior. You pick that person and you pray for that person. And then before you go talk to them, you pray for favor in their sight. That your words will actually do something when you open up your mouth to talk about Jesus. It's like what I call the Nehemiah prayer. You know, back in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. A very important position, almost like the king's bodyguard. In the presence of the king, you could not be unhappy. If you were unhappy in the presence of the king, you got killed. Nehemiah had a burden on his heart to go back to Jerusalem. To build a wall around Jerusalem to protect his family. And that burden made him sad because he couldn't do it. And he's in the presence of the king. And the king says, Nehemiah, what's wrong? If he said the wrong thing, Nehemiah could have been killed. So in that moment, it's only half a verse. Nehemiah prays for favor in the sight of the king. Pray for favor in the sight of the person you are going to share Jesus with pray the Nehemiah prayer. Pick that person, then pray for that person and pray for your words. Keeps going, verses three through seven. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Man, when you are bold enough to tell people about Jesus, you're going to get a lot of back. People might make fun of you. They might put you down. They might not want to hang out with you because you're so bold sharing Jesus with them. But you have to be bold and it is dangerous. Especially in parts other than America. You share the gospel in a lot of other countries, you will get killed because it's illegal. We have a benefit, a blessing of being an American. Amen? Amen. To have the freedom to share the gospel without being killed. But we still don't share the gospel. We still don't share the gospel. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Now, you read this. And he sends out the 72. He sent out the 12. He sent out the 72. He sends out you. And he says, okay, 72, when you go, don't take nothing with you. We can say travel light. Travel light. Why are they going to travel light? He wants them to depend on him. He wants them to depend on him. So when you're sharing the gospel, you're traveling light. You're depending on God. Every step of the way. And I'm going to broaden this up. And I'm just like, when you do it, keep it simple. Keep it simple. When you're sharing the gospel, pray before you go. Then keep the gospel simple. Keep it simple. The last probably month, Ken and I have been working on this house that we bought from my mom and my sister. And we've been doing a lot of things to the house, kind of, you know, touching it up, making it look a little bit nicer. And I've learned a lot of things while we're working on this house. One of the first things I learned was what DIY stands for. How many of you know what DIY stands for? Shout it out. Do it yourself. You know why I didn't know what that is? I'm not a do it yourself to have a person. I like other people to do stuff like that. So I learned what that meant. I also learned as you go, even though you watch HGTV, that does not make you Chip and Joanne. I mean, I learned that big time. I also learned I am not the most patient, best painter in the world, right? There's something about going, and my brain going, I swore with that, but there it goes. And, 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 I mean, this is so bad that after we refinished the floors, this just happened yesterday, after we refinished the floors and we were painting, I spilt white paint all over the floors. And my wife 
exploded and gave me a butt chewing that I deserve. And I praise the Lord for the last six weeks I have been talking about marriage because some of it sunk in and we are still married today. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. But I also learned that when you paint, there's this cool utensil that you can get that speeds up how fast you can paint. It's called a paint roller. <laughs> It just took us three days to figure out what a paint roller was. But the big thing, the big principle that I learned, sometimes it's best just to keep things simple. When you share the gospel, you pray before you go, then you keep things simple. Ooh. Verse 8 and 9. Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, and such things as are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, here's the deal. At this point in time, in the book of Luke, talking about the kingdom is talking about Jesus. Talking about the kingdom is talking about Jesus. That's their version of sharing the gospel at that moment in time. So you pray before you go. You keep it simple then you simply share the gospel. You simply share the gospel. And I think when you share the gospel, you share you. You share your story. You share what God has done in and through you. Every week, I mean, this is probably, there, there might have been one sermon where I didn't say this. Jesus, the gospel of Jesus is that he died on the cross for our sins like the Bible said he was going to do. He was buried. Why was he buried? To prove that he was dead. He rose on the third day like the Bible said he was going to do. He was seen. Why was he seen? To prove that he was alive. He ascended to heaven. He sat down as king of the universe and one day he is coming back. When I share that, all that is is Pastor Joel's paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. That is the verse that the person shared with me the day I accepted Jesus as my Savior. So when I share the gospel that way, all I'm doing is sharing my testimony. That's all I'm doing. And you have to share what God has done for you and through you. But we have to share it. In the movie Woodlawn, it has got a stage that's set in the early 1970s in Alabama. And this was the time when there was still a lot of racial tension. People were rioting all over the place. And in this little town where they were trying to segregate some of the football team, one of the local pastors meets with the football team and does this. All right, guys, let's settle down for a minute. Guys, hey, hey, let's settle down. We have a motivational speaker here. You guys don't mind? Hey, guys. I care about what you see. I care about what you think. 
been through. I care about your pain. So is God. Jerry. I love you so much. It's going on. It's fine. It's been for you. We can wrap this up. Love you too. You need to walk the place. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but just give the guy a chance. You don't want me, but I'm asking you anyway to stand up right now, right here, and make a decision. A decision to change, to forgive, to be forgiven. No matter what you've done, that's how much God loves you. I'm asking you to choose Jesus. that altar call, his version. All the football players go down except one. And the rest of the movie is built around what is this one young man going to do? So after you've prayed about sharing the gospel, after you've made the principle of you're going to keep it simple and you've shared the gospel, what do you do? That's how this one kind of closes. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Jesus is saying, leave the results to me. Leave the results to God. So when you share the gospel, here's what you do. You pray before you go. You keep it simple. You share the gospel. You share what you know. You share your story. Then you leave the results to God. Here's the lesson. Here's the point. If you know, those who know have to go. Those who know have to go. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have to share Jesus with other people because you care about them and where they might go when they die. If you know, you have to go. But before you go, you have to know. And the Bible gives us a lot of lessons on this. The Bible teaches us that God loves you and has a plan for you. God loves you and has a plan for you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to die for you. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, for God so loved me, for God so loved you. That his plan is because of his love for you and sending his son is that you would believe and have everlasting life. Go to heaven when you die. But we have a problem. We have a problem because we are sinners and we are separated from God. We are sinners and we are separated from God. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have made poor choices, bad decisions, all of us hurt. All of us are broken. All of us need help. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it gets worse. Because of that sin, we are eternally separated from God. Romans 6, 23. 
For the wages of sin is death. That means you are going to die once. And if you don't have Jesus, you're going to die twice. An eternal death that sends you to hell because you don't believe in Jesus. But the cool thing, because God loves you, he did send his son. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for me. Christ died for you. And in his death, there's also an opportunity to follow. There's an opportunity to commit. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can receive God's forgiveness when you call on God. You can receive God's eternal destiny in heaven if you believe. Those who know have to go. But before you can go, you have to know. December 26, 2004, there was a, two, a tsunami that hit the Indian Ocean. This is footage of it. On that day, 200,000 people died in the tsunami. And during this time, there was a 11-year-old girl named Tilly Smith. Who, her family had went to one of the oceans on the Indian Ocean. She was there and she was at a beach and she looked at the water and she looked at the sky and she was reminded of something that she saw in geography class. And, and she knew that this was setting up something bad, that something bad was going to happen. And she goes to her mom and dad and she said, Mom and dad, we have to go. We have to do something. There's a natural disaster coming. And she explained the whole situation. At first, mom and dad didn't take her seriously. That they really didn't want to do anything. But as she kept pleading with them, they were convicted. And they actually go to the lifeguards on the beach. And they start sharing what they thought was going to happen with the lifeguards on the beach. Finally, the lifeguards get convicted and moved because of what they thought might happen. And they moved everyone off the beach. 10,000 people off the beach that she was on. 200,000 people died that day. But the 10,000 on her beach didn't because she shared what she knew. There's hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people right now that do not know Jesus. And they are going to die and go into hell unless the followers of Jesus share the gospel, share him with others. Those who know have to go. But you have we go back to Romans 10, 13, and it says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on Jesus can be saved. Question is, are you one of the whoever's? Are you someone who is here today who has never trusted in Jesus? You've never made a public, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. You don't know for sure you're going to go to heaven when you die. And maybe today is the day you need to call on Jesus. And when you call, there's a reason I wanted it on the roller. I just scooted it out of the way. When you call on Jesus, the first part of that is you have to confess. You have to confess 
that you are a sinner. That you've done things in your life that has hurt you. That has hurt others. You have to admit that in the world of the situation you live in, you are broken and you cannot fix yourself. You have to tell Jesus that and say, God, I'm sorry. I need you. I need forgiveness. Please forgive me. And then after you confess, you have to accept. You have to accept Jesus. That means you believe that he is God in the flesh. You believe that he came to this earth to die for you. You believe that, that you are forgiven based on what Jesus did on the cross. And when you declare him as Lord, you will go to heaven when you die. And after you confess and after you accept, then you have to live for him. And maybe that's a lot of people in the truth. You have to live for him. And part of living for him is leading others. You confess, you accept, you live, and then you lead. That is an acrostic. But that's what we're supposed to do. So here's what I want to do. Right now, I'm going to sit down. And if you have never called on Jesus publicly as your Savior, I'm asking you to come. If you are hurt, if you are broken, and you just need a hug, I want you to come. If you just need to be here and people to see you and pray for you, I want you to come. The choice is yours, though. Will you come? And as I sit, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that you will get convicted. That the emotion spiritually will come on you and you will want to move. That you will want the people in this room to pray for you, knowing that they love you. That Jesus loves you. And that you want your world at this moment in time to change. If you don't like your life, if you don't like the dominoes that fall, the part of the problem is you probably haven't fully committed. And if you want to change, and if you want your world to change, you have to commit to Jesus. And now's the time. Won't you come?
Is there anyone else? This is one of those moments that God's already moving. He can keep moving if you allow Him to move. power in the gospel if you believe. There's power in the gospel if you believe. The gospel changes lives if you believe. If you follow. I'm going to close this in prayer and then we're going to be dismissed. Father, we thank you First off, just having us at this moment, at this time, November 1st, 2020, to be able to share the gospel, to be able to respond with people who through the gospel know that we can love each other. We pray for change. We pray for commitment. And we pray that the world will change through hearing the gospel of Jesus because we all know that's the only thing that can change it. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.